the idea behind this panel actually is that um, alternative production and consumption models are nothing new, but were discussed in academia and research already quite a while ago, with, for example, the collateral consumption area being named in the 90s already as a pattern. But technology and the tools it brings us uh, actually allows us now, since a few years, to put those ideas into action. So this gives us, for the first time in history, the opportunity to actually measure and see, empirically see, uh, whether the assumptions we made uh, are actually valid or not. Um, so I'm happy to welcome here three people who are actually wrapped their heads around those issues and are willing to share their thoughts and visions about this topic. Uh, so I would like to welcome and present to you um, Damir Demai, who is Program co Coordinator of the Institute for Sustainable Development and Inst uh, International Relations, Peter van der Glint, uh, Co-Founder and Research uh, at uh, ShareNL, and Rajesh Magwana, Director of the NGO uh, Sharing the World's Resources. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I won't say much more right now, as uh, they will have the opportunity right now to present your thoughts before we actually start the discussion. And uh, I would like to invite you all as well to join us in the discussion later on. So if you have any questions, please be prepared. So would you like to start, Peter? Yes, I'd like to start. So uh, I'm Peter van der Glint from uh, ShareNL, which is the Dutch uh, uh, knowledge and network organization uh, for the collaborative economy. There's a number of people from ShareNL in the room. Maybe they can stand, <coughs> st excuse me, stand up. <laughs> Just so you know, you can talk to them afterwards about this as well. Uh, our vision is that with the collaborative economy as uh, a source, we can create a, wor a world where everyone has access to the products and services that they need to live a happy and sustainable life. And our mission is, the collaborative economy is, is still a baby, like Rachel Botsman said here last year, to develop this collaborative economy and have an eye to both the challenges as well as its opportunities. And we do that by working together with all kinds of different stakeholders, uh, corporations, startups, uh, citizens, uh, governments, universities, uh, etc. And, well, for today, most relevant is uh, the government, because in the, the Netherlands, the Dutch Ministry for the Infrastructure and the Environment, uh, has caught the collaborative economy, uh, has caught their attention. And uh, while they are aware of the circular economy, they are a bit afraid of all the claims that are being made in this field, also by startups in the field, like we are sustainable, uh, we have a positive envir <coughs> environmental impact, and this is not always so sure. So they asked us to actually start investigating this. And to me personally, this was very interesting because I got triggered to, to be active in the space because I saw people behaving sustainably without uh, caring for sustainability. And to me, that was a big opportunity, which we are going to challenge now. Um, well, I'll skip the research question. I'll just go uh, to, the, to the basics that we found. The research is going on. It's, it will be uh, finished in September, so it's an ongoing process. But there, I just want to share with you a few basics that you have to keep in mind when you look at uh, environmental uh, research in this, uh, in this space. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is the importance of the transaction. So each product has a life cycle with a corresponding uh, environmental impact and an impact on resource use. But uh, the transaction itself matters a lot whether it is sustainable. For instance, if you borrow a power drill from a neighbor, uh, uh, the environmental impact is likely to be very positive. But if you borrow a dress uh, through a platform uh, f from somebody that does not live in your street, uh, 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 the, the dress has to go to laundry, then being transported to the one who is actually renting it, then back to laundry, and then back home. So like in the pre previous pre uh, presentation, we are seeing that sometimes the, the, the cost of the transaction can outweigh uh, buying simply a new dress. And then uh, another uh, basic element of all research in the space is the consumer behavior. And uh, what you have to do uh, mostly is just looking at uh, what would uh, a particular consumer had done uh, if the opportunity given by the uh, collaborative economy had not existed. So going back to car sharing, for instance, uh, uh, um, would this particular person has used, have used public transport? Or uh, some people have a second car, maybe they get rid of the second car. And in terms of car sharing, the research is going on now as well in the Netherlands. And it seems like uh, uh, the overall effect is positive because 
the environment, environmental impact of people getting rid of their second car is bigger than the extra kilometers driven in cars by people that now have suddenly have access to it. Uh, okay, so that's a behavior element. And uh, the last basic I want to give to you is that there's just very diverse outcomes. So no one can ever say that the sharing economy is having a potential or a positive environmental impact. You need to look at things like the transaction, the product life cycle, and the behavioral change that comes along with it. Two very big dangers that I am afraid of, even today during all the speakers in the morning session, uh, we are still not clear about definitions. So when I talk about the sharing economy, I mean exclusively uh, people uh, giving each other access to the products that they have temporarily either with or without money. And we use this definition in our research. Make sure if you look at research that people know actually what they are talking about in this sense. The other one is having a, a narrow view. Because uh, um, for instance, if more people have access to a car, they have more access to mobility, and that is negative for the environment. But on the other hand, uh, uh, access to mobility is one of the preconditions for economic opportunities for the citizens in any given society. So. If we do research for one ministry, we want to make sure that other ministries are listening too, because the negative on the one side could be a positive on the other side, and in the end that will be a political question to deal with that. To, to close up, uh, for me the, the biggest opportunity is in the behavioral change, both from people, people demonstrating they want access instead of ownership, companies reacting to that, uh, and delivering access instead of ownership to people. And if you look at circular economy, that's really one of the hallmarks of, of uh, 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 the opportunity where supply chains could be changed. Because then suddenly, like the previous speaker has said, all the right incentives uh, emerge for companies to actually think differently about uh, the assets that they own. Uh, on this opportunity, we will be writing a book in November, and I invite anyone who wants to uh, join us in writing this book on the intersection of the collaborative economy and the circular economy uh, to contact us. We are currently in the process of setting this up with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, a circular economy foundation uh, from the UK. And uh, for us, this is really an experiment. We don't know how much knowledge there is on this topic, so we don't know if there will be 100 people contributing or just five. But Anyone who's here and who's interested, please uh, approach me afterwards or send an email to Peter at Chernow. We're also nearly finishing a book in Dutch and I uh, just want to have one quote from the book. Uh, we transitioned from, a, from 20 regular cars in the street of today to seven reusable and shareable electric cars in the street of tomorrow. Hereby, our access to mobility will only increase. So what I'm saying here is that I believe that the opportunity is both in the collaborative economy and sharing, but also in circular economy and uh, creating closed loops in terms of resources. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing. Uh, Damien, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Maybe just a few words about ADRI, the institution I do work for. ADRI, the policy-oriented research foundation working on sustainability issues. It means that we are a kind of bridge between on the one hand the academic community and on the other hand uh, policymakers mainly but also companies, NGOs and also movements such as the collaborative economic movement of, or, or, or we share for example. Um, first I would say that I, I'm quite happy to see that the environmental impact of the collaborative economy has become an issue that we discuss here really and that we enter into the details, uh, into the figures, and not to, into also the complexity of the analysis. I think for a long time, um, the environmental impact of the collaborative economy has been no more than just an intuition, if not an argument being put forward by some people of the collaborative economy. I think, it, I think it's a progress that we just go beyond this intuition, and that we challenge the intuition and try to better, under to better understand what is the real impact of collaborative economy platforms, for example, in terms of resource consumption, energy consumption, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and so forth. Um, the second thing is that I think there is a big potential uh, for the collaborative economy to contribute to a more sustainable uh, production and to more sustainable consumption. Because as we all know, there are a lot of products that we have today and that are underused, and there is this traditional example of the, the power drill that we use uh, only a few minutes uh, during its lifetime 
or the example of this car when there are only one people in the car, whereas you could, you could have two, three, or maybe four people in the same car. So there are a lot of things that we do underuse. And optimizing the use of the stuff, optimizing the use of the car, is something that the collaborative economy can, can help us uh, doing. So there is a big potential. And at the, at the rule of thumb, um, the, the calculation we made is that the good that we could easily share represent more or less one third of the waste that we do generate as households every year. So there is a big potential. I think it's not, it's not, a, it's not, a, a, it's not a, a debate. The question is now is to what extent the, the platforms that we all know about now uh, make this potential real. Uh, to what extent they help us really reduce our ecological footprint. And this is where it becomes, to me, impossible just to have general, to make general statements on this. You have to investigate further, as it was said by, by Christoph Semple just before. You have to enter into the details to better understand. Uh, I just want to, to give you just two examples, maybe two content-intuitive examples. Uh, the first one is about reselling platforms. Um, we have the idea that thanks to reselling platforms such as eBay or Le Bon Coin in France, um, we can sell things we do not use anymore. So we avoid producing new things and we can use something that is being produced already and give it or sell it to someone else who needs it and who doesn't have to buy a new product. Uh, the problem is that for on a reselling platform, you make money out of reselling your stuff. So you can imagine people having iPhone number five and saying, well, I would like to have the iPhone number six, so I'm going to buy the iPhone to sell the iPhone number five on eBay or Le Bon Coin in order to buy the newest product. People can use peer-to-peer -peer platform that way, and doing so, the environmental impact is not as positive as you could imagine. Um, another example is, is ride sharing. I think ride sharing is good just to really to enter into the details, and you have to differentiate at least between short distance ride sharing, so typically the people going to um, sharing a car just to go to work, and long distance ride sharing. And for example, this is what Blah Blah Car, Blah Blah Car is doing. Um, there are many studies showing that short distance ride sharing is good from the environmental point of view uh, because it competes not with public transport, for example, but it competes with people uh, driving alone their car. So instead of having two cars with, in, with one person in each, you end up with only one car and two person in the car. So it's a good thing from uh, an energy uh, efficiency perspective. But what about long distance ride sharing? Do people, uh, does it compete with a car, with autosolism, as, as some people say, so only one person in a car, or does it compete with train? You could imagine actually that you used to have people taking public transport, high-speed train for example, but it ends up that it's so, cheap, so much cheaper to share a ride to go from Paris to Brussels that in the end you will use a car that you wouldn't, you wouldn't have used before Blah Blah Car appears. Um, so just to give, it's a kind of counter example and do in the end Blah Blah Car reduce our energy consumptions? I don't know. There are not enough studies on that. There are some ongoing studies going on. People, researchers working on that, but so far we, don't, we do not know. So to be uh, clear, maybe to be general, I think there are some uh, collaborative economy platform or collaborative consumption platform that do have a positive environmental impact. And that, that there are other platforms that do not have such a positive impact. And then the question is how to make this platform sustainable. How you can improve your business model to make sure that you will have the positive environmental impact that sometimes you communicate on, for example. So it means that the environment has to become not only an argument, but to become an objective of the entrepreneur of the, of the collaborative economy. And, and I, will, I, will, I will conclude on this. Um, maybe just to be a, a little bit pessimistic, um, we have been doing some interviews with quite a lot of entrepreneurs of the collaborative economy. And my feeling is that there are entrepreneurs for, uh, for whom um, um, the environment is an issue and they're trying to build business model in order to reduce our ecological footprint. 
But for many other, and maybe for the most successful ones, environment is not really an issue. Uh, at best, it could be an argument just to communicate on. But, well, you know, Christoph Semper just before was talking about functionality or functional economy, saying that for the entrepreneur of this movement, the objective is to build a more sustainable world and to try to make profit out of it. But the first objective is to reduce the pressure we have, the pressure we put on the environment. My feeling that for many entrepreneurs of the collaborative economy, it is the other way around. First, you want to do business through these great technologies, platforms, stuff like that. If you may have, you, if you can have a positive environmental impact, it's good. If you don't, I don't think really it's a problem for most, for most of you and for most of us. So, just to repeat me again, the objective now, I think, for this movement is not to use anymore the environmental protection as an argument, but to make it really an objective of the business model that you are, you are, build, you are building and, and developing. Thanks. Thanks, Damien. Maybe we can do some field research later on on the people here and to see whether it's valid. Um, last but not least, Rajesh, would you be willing to share your vision and insights with us? Thank you, yes. Uh, yeah. So I'd like to take a, a broad perspective on the sharing economy in relation to sustainability. Um, there's obviously no denying that collaborative consumption can help some individuals reduce their ecological footprint and, uh, and their carbon emissions. But as my fellow panelists have, have sort of highlighted, um, there are still some doubts remaining around the measurable impact of collaborative consumption on key uh, national and global environmental targets. So, so that's why uh, we at Share the World's Resources, uh, for us it's clear that the scale and urgency of, the, of climate change requires that we work towards a more fundamental transformation of our social, political and economic systems in order to address the root causes of the wider ecological crisis. So as a measure of sustainability, the ecological footprint uh, does a great job illustrating the challenges we face. Already humanity is consuming natural resources 50% faster than they can be replenished. And most people in Western Europe and America live lifestyles that would require between three and five planets worth of resources to sustain. Um, and that of course includes uh, most of us here in this room today. The ecological footprint is also a great measure uh, to highlight the fact that any attempt to create a sustainable world uh, must ultimately be a collaborative process that includes all nations. When we consider sustainability from this global perspective, we need to recognize that millions of people in developing countries live in extreme poverty, well below the threshold of a one-planet lifestyle. As the slide shows, uh, while the richest 20% of the world's population are responsible for 80% of all consumption, over 14 million people die needlessly every year simply because they do not have access to the basic resources such as food, water, and healthcare. So if we're passionate about addressing the environmental crisis, we must acknowledge that structural inequality and economic injustice is at the heart of our social, geopolitical, and environmental problems. Ultimately, the causes of climate change are rooted in complex economic and foreign policy objectives that determine how the planet's resources are exploited by governments and corporations and how goods and services are unequally distributed and consumed across the world. When we consider this holistic picture, it becomes clear that collaborative consumption can only be uh, a small part of the response to climate change, which must necessarily be a, a much broader and more effective response. Uh, the good news is that the systemic solutions to create a more equal and sustainable world are based on the ethic and practice of sharing, not just collaborative consumption and other forms of sharing that take place within com communities, but the sharing of wealth, of power and resources on a nationwide and international basis. And as the slide illustrates, this is apparent, for example, in relation to international climate change negotiations on, on how to... Uh, share the uh, planet's capacity to absorb carbon emissions. The process of sharing is also central to both cap and share and contraction and con uh, convergence models. The concept of fair shares is increasingly being used to frame the debate on how to meet basic needs for all without transgressing environmental limits. And under the common heritage of mankind principle, the number, uh, there's a number of international treaties that exist now for safeguarding and sharing certain global commons, such as the Antarctic and the world's oceans. 
So these are just a few examples, but they highlight the need for many more supporters of the sharing economy and collaborative consumption to get politically engaged in environmental issues and add their voice to the emerging global movement for sharing and justice and, and of course, for sustainability. That's why at Share the World's Resources, we recently launched the, the, the global call for sharing campaign to mobilize cross-sector support for economic sharing to guide our response to some of the most pressing crises we face. In our campaign report, Sharing as Our Common Cause, we highlight how a call for sharing is already central to the demands of individuals and organizations working in very different fields, including peer-to-peer -peer advocates and commoners, uh, social justice activists, environmentalists, and even those campaigning for democracy and peace. Many hundreds of people and organizations in some 60 countries have already added the name to the global call for sharing sign-on statement. And I'd like to invite, invite all of you here as part of the collaborative movement uh, to also consider doing the same. You can go online to sharing.org and, and sign up from there or uh, just uh, search for the global call for sharing. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rajesh. Um, I think we already named quite a few um, like tensions and like boundaries or parts that are missing, but I think we all were quite clear on the potential that sharing has actually for actually having a positive impact. Um, a question I would like to start with is actually that um, we heard in basically all of what you were presenting that uh, the current models of implementations sometimes are not enough or is actually creating tensions. But what do you guys think are the underlying issues creating those tensions? Uh, to me, one of the main issues is people always talk about people, profit and planet as uh, things that uh, would need, need to have synergy. Uh, and to me, ultimately, you have to, we have the opportunity now with these types of models to let them become the same thing. So that should be the goal, that the, the option that's best for the environment should also be economically best. And that, that's uh, a, a, a long way, but that's where we could go with this uh, phenomenon. You can see this in, in many, many, many examples. You make a more efficient use of something, and it's also economically a better option, and I think we need to, to build more on that. Um, yeah, I, th I, think, I think we need to just uh, try and look at the bigger picture here as well. Um, I think, I think that, that's, that's a real tension for me in terms of uh, collaborative consumption and measuring its uh, environmental impacts. Um, there are other forces in, in, in play uh, within economies that can decimate the um, impacts that we could have by reducing our consumption levels. Um, and and these, these come back again to political issues around ideology, around economics, around the, pers the, the pursuit of economic growth, um, consumerism, et cetera. And I think these things need to really be looked at. And we need to, we, we need to work towards sort of having uh, more robust measures of how we are actually reducing our, our environmental impacts in relation to the broader political issues around consumerism. Yeah, because now we have the case with GDP that if you go to car sharing, uh, GDP goes down. But if one of you get hit by a car and, uh, and you need an ambulance, GDP will go up. So there's something wrong, but we know that, and it is so hard to change. So in the Netherlands, you have a company that's trying to monetize uh, social effects. So that's a way to get around with it, or you need some kind of add-on, because GDP is not going to disappear from the political arena, and here you will need some kind of extra way of measuring value. So basically, how would you uh, measure people's access to the things that they need instead of uh, just uh, GDP? Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure I really uh, got the question, but I'm going to answer to it anyway. Um, I think so the tension is that um, we have environmental issues, and we know that thanks to collaborative economy, uh, for example, there are new business models that can help us just reduce our ecological footprints. But as I said, first, it has to become an objective of the entrepreneur of the collaborative economy. So you first have to better understand what is your impact, environmental impact, assess it, evaluate your impact, and then find new solutions. Uh, for example, if I were CEO of Blah Blah Car, 
I would think twice on how I could develop further my activity on short distance ride sharing because, because this is where there is a further with a demand. Uh, and second, because maybe this is where, from the environmental perspective, they're the main potential. So I know it's difficult, and I heard this morning the CEO of Blah Blah Car explain how difficult it is uh, just to develop uh, a business model and to make money out of, of, short, of short distance ride sharing. But this is definitely where you could try to make some effort. But it's not only a, a problem for entrepreneurs, of course, it's also a problem for policymakers. Um, and still, if I, if I, if I uh, uh, keep using the example of, of ride sharing, well, I mean, it's your, um, it's your problem as a policymaker just to make sure that they are efficient public transport system. And if you are efficient, and I would say also maybe cheap enough, uh, high-speed trains, for example, then you will, you will not have this competition between ride-sharing on long distance and train. And maybe you, then you can think differently. You can just stop opposing train and ride-sharing, and you could think in how to complement it, how people can use ride sharing to go to the train station, take a train to go to from north of, to south of France, and then use again ride sharing or any other alternative transportation mode just to go to the to the place where they where, where they want to go. And, and finally, it's also an issue for consumers. I would say, um, as I said, as I said before, with the example of a reselling platform, um, how are you going to use these platforms? How are you going to use these? A marketplace, um, this marketplace is up to you. Are you going to use this marketplace just to consume more stuff? Or are you going to use this marketplace to try to have a more sustainable consumption lifestyles? And well, so just, it's not only the responsibility of the entrepreneur, maybe I overdid a little bit before. It's a, it's, it's a responsibility for, e for everybody. But the tension here is how you make sure that the environment becomes really um, an objective for all these actors. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned already that for businesses, uh, it has to be actually le the main goal of the entrepreneur, like a top priority to make it a solution in the direction of sustainable development before making profits. Is that true? Did I got you right? No, I don't, before making profits. I mean, to a certain extent, sometimes you can do both. Sometimes it's, it's not possible. Sometimes you, 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 can, you can do both. So and, and, and this is what you said also before, and how you can find, and this is what, be, what was said also just before, how you can find new business models, business models that are good for the environment and that are sustainable in the sense that you can make profit out, uh, out of it and you can get enough earnings just for you, for your company just to live and for you also as an entrepreneur to live. Um, and I think there are a lot of possibilities where you can just uh, both uh, at the same time uh, reduce the ecological footprint thanks to your activity and make profit out of it. But you have to look for this opportunity. You have to look for this win-win solution, although I do not like this win-win things most of the time. But at least you have to try to, to look for these win-win solutions, win from the environmental perspective and win from the economic perspective. Yeah, 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 to me, you're not sustainable if you're not making money. So that, that is an essential thing. And it's also good to keep in mind that the extra value that we create as a society, that offers us the breeding ground for new ideas. So to make everything completely tied in, uh, spend all the money you have in your business, uh, even venture capital is eventually money that comes from previous investments. So there is also a value in this massive value that we have organized in our current system. It's not the only one, luckily, anymore, but just to make sure, I think uh, sustainability is money. It is sustainability and it is your social responsibilities, but without the money, you will be gone in one month. Yeah. So we already mentioned uh, policymakers and businesses as stakeholders uh, to bring about this change, but what actually about us as citizens, I mean, you, you mentioned already that it's about the behavior we have in our everyday life or how we use those platforms to bring about social change or uh, sustainable development, but what about like citizen movements or what, as citizen, what can we do as citizens more to, um, to bring about this uh, development we would like to see? Uh. Yeah, citizens, I think uh, if you're a citizen and you're sitting here, spread the awareness to other citizens. Because uh, I believe that most of the people are good-hearted and willing to do the best. But uh, to be honest, the large majority of the people do not care that much about sustainability. So 
in that sense, it's thinking about ways of, 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 of reaching those people. And there's a real power in there because you can have other incentives like uh, time, uh, uh, extra time or an additional income or uh, basically you, the way I frame it lately is make people aware of the extra option that they have today. Uh, from this, their institution to this horizontal networks in the neighborhoods. And um, I do believe that a large majority of the people, because I did consu consumer research myself, will eventually uh, start tapping into this economy, but they will have very different motives. So it's best to tap in, uh, uh, given any group of people tap into to the right motives for them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be sustainability. They will find this along the way. I think, um, you know, I think we need to be clear on what our goals are, whether, we be in, whether we're individuals or we're, we're organizations, companies. If our priority, if one of our key priorities is trying to create a world that is sustainable and equal, then we need, to, we, we need to recognize that there are firstly many other individuals outside of the collaborative economy movement who are working towards exactly the same thing. And they desperately need your support and our support to make that happen. There are campaigners and activists working in civil society um, across the world looking, at, looking towards creating a world to which you're also working towards here, to which all of us are working towards. And, 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 and I think we need to really um, sort of build bridges between the, the processes that we're engaged in here with, with collaborative consumption and sharing and the sharing that people are asking for in terms of wealth, power and resources that, that cut to the heart of the, the sort of systemic issues that underpin the environmental crises. And I think they really need to be coming together because if, if we share the same goals, then why aren't we here talking... Um, with the people involved in the sustainable development goals or the sustain global sustainability issues that are happening, of which there are millions. It's a much, much bigger movement, in fact. It goes back many, many decades. So I think there needs to be a coming together of these movements if our common goal is to create a truly sustainable world. If it's not, if it's to create business platforms, etc., then that, that's fair enough as well. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. It's fantastic especially when they adopt new models that disrupt the old economy. But I think if we're looking to change systems, we, we need to really work in collaboration uh, with others who are working in different ways. Otherwise, you know, uh, we will never create that world that we're trying to work towards ultimately. Actually, we will have a, a workshop during WeShare Fest on this, which is called Think Ocean. It's basically about the convergence of movements, so you might be interested in joining that. Yeah, I think, I mean, as individuals, of course, as I said, I mean, you, first, as a consumer, uh, you can just use all these um, possibilities, all these platforms in a sustainable way. So this is kind of the, your first responsibility, I would say, as a consumer. But then you can also decide to become an entrepreneur of the collaborative economy, or I would say an entrepreneur of this sustainable and collaborative economy. Try to develop your own product, your own platforms. It, it could be for profit, could be non-profit. Uh, actually, I, I don't think it, it really matters. So your responsibility also as a, city, as a citizen is not only to, to criticize what I'm doing here, but also just to become an actor of it and to say, okay, if you're not, ha if you're not happy with, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, what's, what's going on, you can change things yourself. You can become this sustainable and collaborative entrepreneur for profit or not for profit. Cool, okay. Um, I have several more questions written down here, but uh, I really would like to open up to the audience because I'm sure there are some questions in the room. Uh, could you help me out, Floor, maybe with the mic or? Yeah. Thanks. Hi there, uh, it's Manu, founder of Babele. Th thank you for the great intervention, it was great. Um, I have a question actually, uh, which regards like the social innovation. Like there is, uh, there are two branches of thoughts. Like there are people saying uh, like Mohamed Yunus that social innovation initiatives, they should have like uh, non for profit, meaning they should reinvest like every cent of their profit in order to maximize uh, the scale of their impact. Otherwise, there is going to be at some point like a moment in which uh, 
between maximizing profit and maximizing uh, the social impact, there is going to be like a temptation like to maximize uh, the, the, the financial impact. On the other hand, there are all the people that are currently called the impact investors that uh, see a value in all these like triple bottom line of uh, economic prosperity, social uh, equity and environmental quality. But they, th they think that, you know, if there is not like uh, even a 4%, you know, like of return on investment back, like for the investor, then uh, like all those projects are never going to be able to scale. So what's your opinion on this uh, kind of uh, topic? Thank you. Is this like a general question or are you asking someone in specific? Yeah, it was a general question for the three of them. Okay. Sorry. And why did you say that they cannot scale? I, I think. Uh, this is like what uh, impact investors claim. Like that, you know, it's uh, first of all not attractive like uh, to have this kind of organization that they're not, never going to give something back. And second thing is because uh, with this additional money that they can get from uh, uh, social angel investors, they can actually like uh, help those organizations scale much faster than if instead, you know, like they work uh, in the model that uh, Muhammad Yunus was actually promoting. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not so familiar with, uh, with the impact investors, but uh, I think they should talk about growing rather than scaling. So if you have a kind of a, an, an any, any enterprise that is uh, uh, rooted in social values and social capital, then it's likely that it can grow by itself. And I think being an impact investor, then you need to redefine what your added value is to this whatever cost that it is and what you want to get out of it. Um, my thinking about this profit versus non-for-profit uh, distinction is that when it's about the environmental dimension, um, it cares to a certain extent, but not always. I mean, you can do not-for-profit projects where you have a bad environmental impact, and you can do for-profit projects where you have a, a, a good and a great environmental impact. I think car sharing, for example, I mean, uh, I agree and I disagree to a certain extent with what has been said before on the impact of car sharing, but my analysis is that you, uh, for in, in many situations, um, uh, car sharing is very positive just to help people move from a mobility portfolio based only on car to a more diverse and sustainable mobility portfolio with car, public transport, train, biking, whatever. Um, so my thinking is that you may have for-profit companies uh, and may, maybe sometimes that do not care about the environment and that, that have a great and positive impact from the environmental perspective. Okay, so there were two questions. Yeah. Yeah, um, not so much a question, I'm sorry, just a couple of observations on a fascinating uh, uh, conversation. First of all, about business models. Do you mind if I go back 300 years? James, James Watt made the famous James Watt steam engine. And he went to Cornish tin mines and he made them an offer they couldn't refuse. He said, I'll put my James Watt steam engines in. All I want is a third of the coal you saved. And he wasn't bothered about emissions back then. That's the first thing, sharing in coal savings, sharing in carbon savings. Secondly, look to the Danes. 40 years ago in the oil shock, what happened, the Danes had no oil and gas, but they were burning lots. The price went up from $3 to $12 a barrel. And what did the Danes... So, sorry, I, I cannot catch the last thing you said. Maybe a bit louder. Sorry, uh, the Danes, the, the price went up from $3 to $12 a barrel, and the Danes thought, oh, shit, okay? And they took a decision back then, 40 years ago, that in future, for a given output of electricity, heat, and power in Denmark, they would minimize the carbon fuel going into this system. In 40 years, GDP has doubled, energy use has been flat, carbon fuel use has declined. This principle, I call it the least carbon fuel cost principle. This is not the least dollar cost principle. This is not the least euro cost principle. This is how you get things down. You give people an energy return. You mentioned markets. I know something about markets. And I do know that a market in CO2, which is worthless, it's like taking what comes out of a cow rather than what goes into the cow. We actually need to monetize the energy value of carbon, okay? That's what I mean when I talk about open capital and credits and a return in energy, okay? 
energy, a return, invest directly in energy savings. Because this is completely possible. I'm doing this in Scotland. If you actually offer people a return in energy savings, the more expensive carbon fuel gets, the more money they make. That's a good business model. But I've said quite enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great thing. I, I, I believe in that too. <laughs> No, actually, my brother is helping companies to uh, lower their energy bill and there they, they can be investors in investing in it. And I think that's very worthwhile. So uh, not what goes into the, uh, no, what goes out of the cow comes out, but what goes in. No, I think that's a great point. Yeah. Hi, my name is Emma. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about um, how we can avoid a rebound effect. Um, should I? Can Maybe you quickly explain? Yeah. For example, if I'm a member in a tool library and I save money because I borrow my tools and the same money I use with another service that's have a negative effect of, for the environment. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah. So there again, that's the argument. If you talk to people, say it is bad for the economy. So no, people s save money and they're going to spend it elsewhere. So then they're happy. But environmentally, that's something that needs to be researched. Uh, to me, uh, the gut feeling is that every, every, every market related to around leisure, for instance, will, will grow because people get more time and money to spend on things to do because they need to own less or spend on owning. But these rebound effects, uh, they're not even secondary effects. They're in terms of research, these are the hardest ones to, to, to grasp. So tell me if, if you have an idea on how to do that. Again, you can ask the question, uh, what do you do with the money you save? And then whatever comes out of it from a representative population, uh, do the calculations. But I'm not even sure if that's how far you want to go with this. I think that's quite an interesting question and conversation we're having here, but unfortunately we're already running out of time. It's just, but I think this is a discussion we should definitely continue uh, to, uh, to have, uh, not only like here on stage, but also online or I think it's really important to get it the way we really want it to be. So I uh, thank you all for coming, for being here, and I hope you will have some awesome two more days here uh, at Wisher Fest. Um, also, you mentioned some points how to get into action straight away. So you mentioned uh, um, the report you were publishing and where people can sign up if they like it. You mentioned uh, the book you're actually publishing where people are invited to join in. So um, speaking about action, we will now leave actually the analysis part uh, in this panel and go to action in the next panel, which will be uh, strategies for citizen engagement, uh, moderated by Flor, my colleague, um, who invited Alison Cook, Roxanne and Antoine to the panel. <laughs>